Good morning, everybody. Here in Waterloo. Good morning to everybody that's over in West Side and everybody that's watching online. My name's Pete, and I'm one of the pastors here, as most of you know, I think. But if you're if you're joining us for the, one of the first times, uh, my name's Pete, and uh, I'm glad that you're paying attention. And we're in this series called Good News, and this is the third week of the series. So, so if you haven't been with us like the last two weeks, I'd encourage you to go watch those at some point because because I'm going to be referring to those other two weeks. I can't I can't do every week like brand new and start from scratch. Okay, we got to trying to build here. Okay, this is the third week in this series, and to just give you a little bit of a, of a reminder, the first week we talked about how originally. The good news, or the word sometimes we use gospel, or in the Greek, it's the word euangelion, that originally this good news or gospel was always about the proclamation of the Christ, which is to say the anointed one, which is to say in more contemporary language, the king. The good news in the New Testament is always rooted by this announcement of a new reality. There's a new king coming. And there's a new kingdom coming with this king. So that was week one of the series. Week two last week, we talked about how this good news of the king enters into a story that has been being told since long before this new king, Jesus, arrives in this story. This this gospel announcement of this king, it fits into this bigger story that God is telling about his desire to have a creation that reflects his glory. A creation filled with image bearers, people that are obedient and faithful and that act and live in the world the way that God would if he were us. But that project fails at the beginning and it needs redemption. And so the good news of the king comes into this story and it's the good news of a king who along with him brings a kingdom that is redeeming this glory project, this fallen creation project. And what I hope that you experience as we talk about some of these bigger themes within the Bible is a bit of a, a reorienting. You know, sometimes you get like disoriented in life and you need like to be reoriented. I sometimes think of Sunday morning as like that. Like you live your life during the week and you go off and you're like worried about work and you're worried about the bills. And you're worried about other relationships that you have and you get worried about all these other things and you get afraid and you get stressed out. And eventually you're like, what, what is most important? How do I get, what, like, what should I, where should I be facing? And you come to church and it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's how I align my life. It makes sense of my life. These are the things I should be thinking about, and these are the things that I don't need to worry about. It reminds me of when I'm on my, my GPS app. If you use the Google app, uh, if you just have it set on like the default, when you're, when you're going through the city, every turn that you make, it turns the whole map. Have you ever noticed this? It turns the whole map. So if you're going south, it actually puts the map upside down, which I hate because it's so disorienting. Like, I'm trying to learn the city, and I know the city when I see it, and it's facing north, right? I'm like, that's my city. I know how to get around that city. If you flip it upside down, I'm totally lost. I'm like, I don't even know if I can find my way home. Like, where is this? And so on the app, there's a little compass in the top right, and if you press that little compass, it flips it around and points it north again. I feel like sometimes we need that little button in our life, and Sunday mornings is like that, and I hope that a series like this, talking about these big themes, does that for you. It gives you a bit of a reorientation. You're like, okay, I, I know lots of things about Christianity. I know lots of things about the different books, but sometimes I get, I, get cons- I get a little bit lost in all of the things that I'm learning, and I hope a series like this helps to reorient you and be like, oh, that's, okay, that's the most important, that's the center, and upon that I build all the other things that I'm learning. So we've been talking about the proclamation of the good news is about a new king, about a new kingdom. It fits into a bigger story. And today what I want to talk about is questions that naturally emerge out of this proclamation. So if you go around proclaiming there's a new king and there's a new kingdom, well, there's certain questions that naturally emerge that need to be answered. Questions like, well, what is this king like and what's his kingdom like? I think it's helpful, actually, as you read through the Gospels, the four accounts of the life of Jesus, they're called the Gospels. They're called the good news 
about this new King Jesus and his kingdom, it's helpful to see those and read those through that lens that they are announcing as Mark begins in Mark chapter one, verse one, the good news about Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the King, the son of God. He begins with that and you're supposed to be queued up to be like, oh, so all the rest of this book is telling me about what this king is like and what his kingdom's like. So what is this king like as you read through the Gospels? You'll, you'll notice things like, man, this king, this, this Jesus, he's, he's so secure. He's so secure with, with everything that he does. Like, he has his own pace. He's got, he's got the, the empire pushing in on him with its ideals. He's got, he's got the religious infrastructure and the religious leaders pushing in on him. He's got crowds at times of thousands of people who all have a unique agenda for Jesus. And Jesus is unaffected by all of it. He goes where he plans to go and he says what he plans to say. There's even one point where they get him to like the edge of a cliff and it's like they want to kill him and they're going to push him off this cliff and it doesn't say Jesus like used his judo moves that he knows or anything. He just, he just slips away. How did he do that? I don't know. He just, he was just in control all the time. People tried to trap him with certain questions and he just always knew what to say. He had his own pace and this internal security to him. What is this king like? This king, he, he welcomes people. He welcomed people. People, he welcomed tax collectors. He welcomed sinners. We all hear that part, right? He welcomed the least likely people to welcome, but he also welcomed the religious people and he welcomed the Roman soldiers. He, he welcomed everybody, which threw a lot of people off. This king, this king, he, he doesn't seem to play favorites. And this king, he's, he's so merciful. You know, the story of the woman caught in adultery and she's brought before Jesus and it's, it's a trap. They want to get Jesus to say that we should kill this woman. And they say, we have it in our law. Like in our law, it says, you find somebody committing adultery, adultery we can stone them. And Jesus, again, not hurried, controls the pace. It says at one point in the story, he, he bends down and he starts writing in the dirt. And you're like, this is such an intense moment. Jesus, what are we going to do? We should kill her. We should kill her. Yeah, we should kill her. And Jesus is like, let's take, a, let's take a breath. He starts doodling something in the sand. Eventually he gets up and he says to them, how about we do this? The, the person here who is without sin, they can throw the first stone. And all the men, one by one, slowly leave. And there's a little detail to that line that maybe you haven't noticed before. He who is without sin can throw the first stone. There's somebody in this story who is without sin and could have thrown the first stone. Jesus could have thrown the first stone and yet after all of the men have left, he says to the woman, is there no one left here to condemn you? Well, then neither do I. Go and leave your life of sin and begin a new life because of this encounter that you've had with me. Jesus, this this king, he's so merciful and he's so compassionate. As you read through, you're like, he's actually with us. He's not above us. Like he's kind of here, but he's like way up here. He's really with us. We see it when he weeps. He weeps over the death of a friend. He weeps over the the tragedy that will befall Jerusalem, the city. He, He weeps And yet he also has outbursts where he flips over the tables in the temple because such injustice is happening. He's truly God with us, with this deep compassion. And then maybe most surprising of all, and if you were to pick one word to describe what this king is like, that would have been so unexpected to everyone, is he's so humble. He constantly is trying to teach his disciples, the guys that are closest to him, I have come to serve and to be a ransom for many. And he's trying to teach them that he wants them to serve too. But he's constantly fighting their own imaginations. He's constantly fighting what they would have imagined the Messiah, the Christ, the King to have been since they were little boys. 
ever since we were little boys. We, we dreamed of the king who would come and rescue our, our nation. And he would be riding a horse and he would have a sword and he would lead us to overthrow the Roman Empire. All their life they waited and were looking for this kind of king. And Jesus, it's like he's slowly always just trying to be like, that's not who you should have been expecting. And that's not who I am. Imagine these, these boys who are becoming men as they follow Jesus and he talked about servanthood and they were like, yeah, servanthood, but, but a horse and a sword too, right? And eventually on the night before he dies, he decides to pick up a towel and he wraps it around his waist and he starts to wash their feet. He serves them. They would have been like, what is, who is this king? He's so, what is this king like? He's so humble. This king, he's, He's unlike any king that the world had ever seen or will ever see since. And what is his kingdom like? If he's a king who's coming, what's this kingdom like that, he, that he's bringing? Well, this is one of the main things that Jesus teaches about. This is the language of Jesus. It's, it's almost like everybody around Jesus points to Jesus as, there's the king, he's the king. But Jesus keeps pointing to the kingdom. He keeps pointing to this thing that he's bringing, this, this new world that he's bringing. And he says, this, this kingdom, this new thing that God is doing, it's like a treasure hidden in a field. And when you find it, you will leave and in great joy, get rid of everything else that is connected to holding you down in life and you'll come back and buy that treasure. It's like a treasure. It's like this pearl of great price. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a mustard seed which was Jesus' way of saying, this kingdom, how will it come? Will it come with lots of pomp and circumstance? Will it come like a parade? Will it come with force? And Jesus is like, that's not how my kingdom operates. My kingdom is like, it's like a tiny seed that will be planted in the earth and then it will begin to grow. And as it grows into a tree, into this bush, it will invite all kinds of unexpected people to come and live in its branches. My kingdom does not come by force. This kingdom, it comes with this winsomeness that will draw people into it. What is, what is this kingdom like? It's like, Jesus says, it's like a landowner. It's like a landowner who, who hires people at different times in the day. He hires people in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. And when it comes time to pay these people, he pays them all the same wage, which is his way of saying the kingdom is a gift. It's not a place where you have to earn your wages. It comes as a gift. What is the, the kingdom like? It's, it's a kingdom that will come with justice. Jesus tells other stories about how the kingdom, one day the king will return to his kingdom. And when he finds those who are doing evil, when he finds those who are oppressing others, he will deal with them. He will judge them correctly because his kingdom is one where the poor are taken care of and the refugees are given homes and the widows are taken care of and the orphans are taken care of. What is this kingdom like? It's like, Jesus would say, it's like a feast. It's like a wedding feast. Or who's invited? All the, all the most important people, the most, sure, all the most royal people too. But then he tells these stories where like when those people don't want to come, you know who else gets invited? Everybody else. Go to the alleyways, go to the countrysides, go find everybody else and bring them in to this feast. Because in my kingdom, everybody's welcome at the table. What is the kingdom like? It's like, it's like a son who demands his inheritance and goes and spends it all in wild living. And eventually he finds himself eating among pigs. And he has a monologue in his head about how he has become so unworthy of his father's love. He hopes that maybe he could go home and be a hired servant for his father again. So he sets off for home thinking to himself, I'm so unworthy, but maybe my father will let me sleep in the barn and do some work and I could like just just crank out an existence there with him. But while he was a long ways off, his father sees him and runs to him and declares, my son who was dead is alive again, who was lost is now found. We need to throw a party for him. What is the kingdom of God like? It's like, it's like people turning 
in finding the love of God right there to welcome them home. What is this king like? What is this kingdom like? They're beautiful. They're winsome. You hear about them. You hear the stories about him and about this kingdom and you cannot help but to be drawn to them. And if you are not drawn to them, then somebody hasn't told the story right because they are to be so winsome to us. The gospel is the announcement of the reality that there is a new king and a new kingdom. And he is beautiful. And his kingdom is so beautiful. These might be some of the questions that you ask. Another question that might get asked when you hear the announcement of King Jesus is how is his kingdom beneficial? Some of the things in this category are some of the things that we sometimes focus on the most. And, and while they are important and while they are pieces of the story, sometimes we blow them up to make them into the whole big story. But hopefully through this series, you're realizing that I've framed it in such a way that these pieces that we're about to talk about fit into the larger narrative. Jesus is the king, and because he is king, there are benefits to those who submit to his rule, who enter into his kingdom life. And so there's lots of things in this category we could talk about. I just want to hit four really quickly this morning. The first one we get from Paul in his letter to the church in Corinth. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. So he, he's talking about the gospel here. And then he gets to this, this part where he says, for what I received, meaning the gospel that he received, I passed on to you as first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then he goes on and there's more to this definition which you should go home and read. But I just want to focus on these three pieces that I have highlighted here. Who died? Jesus? Yes, Jesus, but, but the title that Paul uses is very important and hopefully if you've been tracking with this series you'll realize how important it is that he says who, who died? The king died. Not just Jesus some guy. Jesus, the king, died. For me, for me, Jesus died for me. I've heard that before. For our sins. He died so that you could join something that is way bigger than you. God is creating a new people, a new nation, a new family. And he died so that you could join into that. It's not an individualist story. It's a communal story. The king died for our sins so that we could be his people according to the scriptures. Does Paul have the New Testament at this time? He doesn't have the New Testament. He doesn't have the gospel. So when he says scriptures, he means the Old Testament, which is his way of saying there was a story before Jesus got here that was always leading up to Jesus. This story that begins in Genesis was always foretelling and needed this king to show up. Paul, when he announces the good news of Jesus, he connects it back. This is part of a bigger story. This good news is, the, is this fulfillment moment, this climactic moment that we've been waiting for in this story according to the scriptures. And because the king died for our sins, well, that means that all of the separation that sin creates, the separation between us and God, the separation between us and one another, the separation between us and our role as, as, as keepers, as, as servants and safeguarders of creation, all of those separations can be reconciled because sin has been dealt with. One of the benefits of the king is that he has died for our sins. Another benefit, adoption, because he has reconciled us to the Father we can now call ourselves sons and daughters of God. We have this new identity that overrides anything that we've done in our past. You may have uh, memories of things like, I did these things, aren't I still connected to those? And Paul in his letters would be like, no, no, you have a new identity now and none of those things define you anymore. And you find this, this language of adoption. Like you've been brought out of that darkness into this new family where you have a new identity. Another benefit of the king, something that you've probably heard of at some point in your life, eternal life. Jesus actually defines eternal life for us. There's only one place where we get a definition from Jesus about eternal life. We're gonna read it. It's in John chapter 17, verse three. This is how Jesus defines eternal life. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus the Christ, 
whom you have sent. Oftentimes, we think of eternal life. What do you, what's the first thing that probably came to your mind? Life that goes on forever. Like, yes, good, check, goes on forever. But perhaps before we say that part, we say, no, it's a life that's connected to God. It's a quality of life with this intimate fellowship with God, the God of life. And because we are connected to the God of life, well, of course, if we walk with him, then we'll live forever. So it's a quantity of life, yes, but it's also, and I think first and foremost, a quality of life. And because it's this certain quality of life, it leads to this quantity of life. Which when you start to see it that way, which I would suggest is the way that Jesus sees it, brings us back to the bigger story once again. A story that's not about one day we'll go somewhere else, often referred to as heaven, and we'll live forever there. That's not the story that the Bible's telling. The story the Bible's telling is of a new creation one day where we will live as the image bearers that we were created to be. Paul keeps this in focus in his letter to the Romans, one of his most theologically dense letters. And if you look at it, he bookends his entire book. The whole book of Romans is bookended with this idea. He says it in Romans chapter one, verse five, and then he says it again in his last chapter at the closing of his book. And he draws us back to what we were created for, not to go somewhere else, but to be here as faithful, obedient image bearers. Look at what he says. I'm, I'm not going to read the, the, the opening chapter. You can find it, Romans chapter 1, verse 5. But this is what he says to close his book. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus, the Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. He makes this long argument and he gets to the end of his book and he says, so that. All of this, this, this gospel announcement is so that. All the Gentiles, meaning all the people, all the non-Jews, everybody else that's going to come flooding into the kingdom, all of them might come to the obedience that comes from faith, that they would give their trust and their allegiance to King Jesus, and in doing that would become obedient. You see how that ties into this bigger narrative, this bigger narrative about God's desire to have creation be a reflection of who he is. All the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. Matthew Bates sums up these points nicely in his book, uh, The Gospel Precisely, which I've quoted many times throughout the series because I kind of am building the series off of the book. But he takes these ideas about eternal life and he says them this way, and, it, and he gives us maybe a new phrase that might help, help us to try on. He says this, the gospel's final aim is not heaven, but loyal obedience to Jesus the King in a new era, think new era, think, think when the kingdom comes in its fullness, think the new creation when, when Jesus the king returns and there's a new heaven and a new earth, in a new era, an era characterized by everlasting life. We are on steadier biblical ground if we say a key gospel aim is everlasting resurrection life rather than heaven. I like that. For some of you, uh, things are clicking, but I just thought that might be helpful for some of us. Think everlasting resurrection life. That's the hope of the New Testament. Jesus has been raised. And so one day we too will be raised to an everlasting resurrection life, not a disembodied life in heaven floating on clouds, but a embodied, physical, new resurrection life in a new creation. What are the benefits of the king? I've given you three things, dealing with sin, adoption, everlasting life, and lastly, Jesus and the Father send to us the Holy Spirit. He sends to us the Holy Spirit, this, this spirit that would indwell us and be our guide and would bring us peace and would empower us to be obedient. Empower us to, as the language of the New Testament says, would, to bear fruit to bear good fruit. Paul lists them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And one day you too will be able to do that if you set your minds to it. There's only seven. You just break them up. You memorize. It's all good. The Holy Spirit comes to empower us. I, I try to teach my boys this kind of stuff. I'm always focusing on like one thing at a time as I teach them. And right now I'm focusing on this idea that the Holy Spirit empowers us to overcome sin. And I use the story of Cain and Abel. You know Cain and Abel in the Bible, the brothers? And they're, they're, one of them gets really angry. Cain gets angry. He's angry at God. He's angry at his brother. And he eventually goes and he kills his brother. But before he kills his brother, there's this great line that God says to him. God comes to him and he's like, Cain, I see that you are angry. And I don't know why you're so angry because you could do what's good here. You could do what's good, but be careful because, because and he uses this language, there is a, there is something, sin is crouching at your door, which is supposed to be this, this language like crouching. It's like a physical, it's kind of like, there is like a beast crouching at your door. And what it wants to do is when you come outside the door, it's going to jump on you. It's going to take you and it's going to drag you down. But God says to him, you can master it. You could subdue it. Sin is crouching at your door, but you could rule over it. So we get an image of like, there's like a beast, like an animal crouching at Cain's door. And God says to him, you could rule over this thing. Where have we heard that language before? We could rule over a beast. This is what we were created to do. And the Holy Spirit gives us the power to be able to rule over sin when it crouches at our door. I said I use this to teach my boys because they love this imagery. Whenever they're getting angry, they're like, I just want to punch my brother. I'm like, sin is crouching at your door. <laughs> and they like, they love that. They, they, they picture it. I'm like, when you want to punch your brother, it's sin crouching at your door. And they'll come to me with reports of like, dad, today sin was crouching at my door. And I'm, like, and I'm like, but the spirit is within you and gives you power to overcome that and not be dragged into it. And when you overcome sin crouching at your door, you are being the image bearer that you were created to be. There are benefits to the king. There are benefits to the king. He draws us in with his winsomeness and then we find, wow, this life that he gives us. And one last question that probably comes to mind that we find throughout the scriptures is this. When you hear the announcement, there's a new king and there's a new kingdom. So what should we do? What should we, what should we do? There's a new king, there's a new kingdom. There's all these benefits if I join. How, it's only like, how, how, do, how do I join? At the end of Peter's sermon on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out to all the nations, Peter says this. We looked at part of it in week one, and we're going to look at the whole thing now. At the end of his sermon, he makes this great case about how Jesus has become king. And then he says, therefore... Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah or Christ. He has made Jesus king. That's the gospel. The gospel is an announcement of a reality. Jesus is king. And when that announcement goes out, people then ask. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what? Shall we do? They hear the gospel and then they respond. And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus the Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. I love that. It's for everybody who finds themselves far off. A, a callback maybe to that prodigal son story. This is, this is for everybody. What, Peter, what do we have to do? There's a new king, there's a new king. What do we have to do? Repent, which means to turn. It also carries with it a heavy sense of change your mind. Change your thinking. Step into the reality that Jesus really is king and submit your life to him. Give him your full allegiance. Repent 
and then be baptized. Repent, make this decision, and then tell the world about it. There's another great story a couple chapters later in the book of Acts. Peter and John have got themselves into trouble. They got themselves into trouble because they healed a guy that couldn't walk. And when the religious people hear about this, they're like, well, we can't have that. Can't have you guys walking around telling people Jesus is king and healing people. We're not going to have that. So, So they bring Peter and John before them. And they're like, by what power do you do this? And in whose name are you doing these sorts of things? And it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says to them, we do this in the name of Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth. He is the stone that you builders have rejected and yet God has taken him and made him the whole cornerstone upon which he is redeeming the whole creation. And then Peter ends his answer to these religious people by saying this, salvation is found in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I love this ending. I love, that he, I love that he ties salvation, not just to Jesus died for our sins, but he ties it, the direct context is that this man went from, I couldn't walk, I couldn't really live, and yet I met these guys, and by the power of Jesus the King, I can walk again. That's a type of salvation, and in this story, that's what they're directly referring to. Life is found in no other name. I love that emphasis too. No one else. There is no other name. I heard a preacher say it once this way and it's always stuck with me. No one else is coming. No one else is coming. There are many ways to God, not according to Jesus, not according to the people that follow him. There is no one else that's coming. For some of us listening, that alone cuts to your heart. But where I hope you eventually get to is a place where you say, even if there was another way, I wouldn't be looking for it because once I find Jesus, I found the greatest thing I could imagine. I found the treasure buried in the field. I'm I'm not looking anymore. If there was another way, I wouldn't want it because I'm so in love with him and his kingdom. I know most of the people that I'm looking at in this room and most of the people watching online have already made this decision. They've decided like, I'm, uh, Jesus is my king and I trust him. But I know that maybe there's some people here who have never made this decision and you feel like a stirring in your heart right now. You feel like an e- uneasiness like Pete, just pray and let me go. P- pray and let me go. Pray and let me go. But you feel a stirring because the king is in the room. And he's talking to you and he's inviting you. He's calling you. Trust me. Step out of the darkness and into the light. And if you've never made that decision, I wanted to just offer you a very simple prayer that will give you some words to make that decision. Jesus, you are king. It's just a declaration that you accept the reality that he is the king. I trust you which has a ton baked into it. I trust, I trust that you died for my sins. I trust, that, I trust that if I follow you, you'll lead me into green pastures. You'll lead me into life. I, I trust you, meaning, meaning I give you my full allegiance. I give you my full life. I will follow you. Would you help me? Would you send your spirit to indwell me and help me to follow you? If you've never made a, a decision and you're getting to the place where like, I need to make a decision, I need to say, I need to say something in this category to say, like, I, I identify with the king and his kingdom. I want to respond. I invite you just to read this with me and, and for all of us to read it together. Let's read it. Jesus, you are king. I trust you. Help me to follow you. If you've never prayed that before, if you've never made a decision like that before. I invite you to find us up at the front. There'll be people praying. I'll be up at the front after the service. We'd love to speak with you. If you're in West Side, come on over here and find one of us. If you're online, type something in the chat. Let somebody know that you just prayed that for the first time. 
And after you make that decision, then you just keep following. And one of the best ways I find to, to reorient myself as I follow Jesus, when I, feel like I, when I feel like I need that reorienting, is to just pray the prayer that he gave us to pray. And so I thought we'd end this morning by, by praying this simple prayer that Jesus gives us. But I want you to hear it as a reorienting. And maybe go home later on today and read through it slowly and be like, are all of these things true of my life? Particularly when we get to the part that says, that says, forgive us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Notice how those two are tied together. They're tied together because the invitation is not just to have your sins forgiven. The invitation into the kingdom is to enter into the way of forgiveness where you receive forgiveness as you give forgiveness. It's not just a, give, give me forgiveness, I'll take it. No, no, it's a, it's a help me to step into the way of the kingdom, the way of forgiveness. So let's pray this as we end this morning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, we thank you that you're in the room, that you're in the rooms where people are gathered watching this, and that you are faithful to speak into our lives. God, for people that made a new decision today, we trust that they will get connected to us and begin to, to be a part of the church. This isn't a one-time transaction thing that happened. This is, this is a moment where their lives are changed forever and they're, they're stepping into a new family and we trust that they'll get in touch with us. Jesus, we thank you that you are such a good and beautiful king who brings redemption. Help us to, to walk in that. Help us to be obedient image bearers. Jesus, we love you. We pray these things to the Father in your name. Amen.